March 2024, episode 166, Red Leaf Retrocast Anime, talking Ghost in the Shell, and unfortunately the death of Akira Toriyama, and worldwide it's uh, it's been a movement of in support of this man. It's pretty wild, guys. Yeah, it is. True, true. We we watched what uh, Sandland and Doctor Slump for the podcast. Well, we read Sandland and then we watched Doctor Slump. Yeah, yeah. And know. then we've done season one of Dragon Ball. Never done Dragon Ball Z, but I mean, shit. In terms of worldwide reach that this man had, whether it was the video games he was involved with or the shows, namely the Dragon Ball franchise, uh. I mean, worldwide popularity, you saw it in, I, I mean, at, at least what I saw, it, it was such a variety of different support, whether you're watching an NHL game, Dortmund in the Bundesliga doing Kamehameha waves after they scored a goal. Uh, every form of, of media that I could see was mourning the death of this guy uh, because a good chunk of this generation that we're all in grew up with this man's work. And it's a lot of people he touched. Yeah. Everyone was glued to his violent cartoons that were poisoning the kids or whatever that <laughs> 90s news article was. <laughs> I did oh, see yeah. I did see a few of those where it's like uh, they're showing <laughs> images of like Mr. Popo and how racist he was. And it's like, dude, <laughs> that's that's not what that is. Yeah, it, it ruined a generation <laughs> yeah, of nah. kids. Instead of playing outside, yeah, they were watching cartoons. How dare they? Instead of playing outside, they grew up to be athletes, man. <laughs> yeah. Bastards. <laughs> Rich, multi-millionaire athletes. <laughs> uh, man, yeah, no, I mean, this guy was... Uh, to say that he was influential is uh, a, a bit of an understatement, but yeah. You know? It's like, just talking about, like, uh, Dragon Ball in particular, just seeing the influence on that, and it's like... You know, especially when my generation and stuff like we're mostly used to talk about like Pokemon is like that big mm -hmm. thing, but for a lot of people, Dragon Ball was that as well. And especially when you get to Asia, man, like Dragon Ball is still bigger than Pokemon over there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, and it's I been a while. Latin America as well is just. I mean, Pokemon is very famous, but you cannot, you just cannot compare with Dragon Ball. They still scream yeah. like every single time there's a new Dragon Ball movie. They actually scream it for multiple days. Usually anime anime movies, you get like one day and it's like an odd time, like midnight. And you get out of the cinema, like the movie theater, 2, 3 a.m. <laughs> I've done that <laughs> a few times. <laughs> but uh, if, and for like big movies, you know, just like uh, the, the, the real special things. But Dragon Ball is always treated as a normal movie, which really speaks out to how popular it is. Yeah, and you mentioned Pokemon being that level of popularity. Uh, I think the difference is between something like Dragon Ball is we can attribute it to Akira Toriyama. Pokemon isn't really... <laughs> I can't think of the guy who's directly behind it. You know what I mean? True. Uh... I mean, they, like the best thing you get is like Nintendo. Maybe you go so far as to go Game Freak, but you know that's <laughs> yeah. I I do remember reading about like I do remember hearing the name. Yeah, I do remember hearing the name of the guy that created Pokemon many times, but I always forget it. <laughs> exactly. Well, you never forget Akira Toyama and what he's done. And yeah. the other thing is, it's always been but an again, evolving show I... and and uh, mm. evolving. But to be fair as well, like Akira Toriyama had a lot more public presence. <laughs> oh, he certainly uh, did. Yeah. He wasn't exactly. He, he was very, very actively involved in, in general, and just like the fandom and whatnot. Like he was, he was an active par participant. A lot of, a lot of creators tend to not be, which I mean, it's understandable. <laughs> like, I I know for a fact that if I created a massively popular series, I'd probably also just still sit, sit inside and be like, nah, I'd rather not. Right. I, I mean, I'd I rather not, not be surrounded by everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll not. I'll not. I'll not do anything. I'll just, just stay home and just, you know, answer emails and, you know, just, just the normal thing. 
pretty much. Man, cannot believe the Dragon Ball is based on the journey to the West. <laughs> yeah, it's based on a, a lot of religion throughout the throughout the show. Um, a lot of religion in a lot of his works. Uh, the art style is very distinct, and before before. Uh, yeah, before the, the, the more modern era, it was very crisp, and it stood the test of time, even from the 80s through the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, you know his art style, you know the hair, it's kind of synonymous with anime hair, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's all eyes, based on him. The eyes, are also you know, the eyebrows, Yeah, the thick eyebrows, and <laughs> the really bony structure of faces. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is kind of a Neanderthal. <laughs> and his characters became synonymous with generations, uh, whether you want to go into video games with uh, Chrono Trigger. Dragon Quest. Dragon Quest, of course. And then, naturally, Goku and Dragon Ball. Uh, Arale. Yeah. Dr. Slump. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. So, Kiri Toriyama will be missed. Uh, you guys any, got anything to add to it? No, it's just unfortunate. Things happen. I, you know, things of life, you know, you cannot predict that. He was just, he had like a, a brain emoji and that's it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, very yeah. sad. Uh, on, on a lighter note, um, kind of tough to transition away from it but um this is the ghost in the shell episode and ghost of the shell means a lot to me and and it has a lot to do with uh the changing of and evolving of technology the ever so question of uh robot par parts and brains and uh androids and all this and um what's significant about that is the standalone complex series season one the original events of the show really took place in the era we're living now, uh, 2021 through 2024. Mm -hmm. And Hickey, you were telling me that in Japan, they're ha essentially doing Laughing Man um, commercialism, right? For the anniversary? Yep. Yeah, yeah they changed a few things. Uh, the, the publisher uh, hacked, quote unquote. <laughs> the standalone uh, standalone complex website and put the laughing man over the the faces of the the characters and the the publisher the Japanese site of the publisher I don't know why they didn't do the English one but the message of the higher ups they also put the laughing man over the the face of the CEO for example as it was happening in the same day as the the events of the laughing man happened which was february 2024 i won't remember the the actual day yeah you watch okay. like episode two of the show and it's covering the laughing man case and it's in like it's on like february 19th 2024 and it coincided yes. with the exact time we were watching the show so it's really great how mm -hmm. these coincidences <laughs> kind of run together <laughs> they they also released like a special icon if you wanted to like uh, use for uh, free of copyright that says uh, it's the Laughing Man symbol, but it, it read standalone complex Laughing Man incident zero anniversary <laughs> because it wasn't the day that it happened, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, even but though what the are show you came talking out, about yeah. man, what are you talking about, man? Where this was clearly planned, we definitely planned to do. Ghost in the Shell standalone <laughs> complex right on the anniversary. We we plan stuff ahead here. Well, it's a different we, sort of anniversary. It's the anniversary of the show. It's like what the events I in the know. show, not not like release of the show. It's I know. Yeah, it's wild. I know. That's it's, I don't know it's if planned. It's, if it's our monkey brains subconscious <laughs> working, but we have a lot of those kind of coincidences where we we cover yeah. shows and anniversaries and and why not it's like oh yeah we recorded the show it, it came out exactly 10 years ago what the <laughs> exactly 15 years <laughs> exactly 50 years like oh 
oh, and like we're watching the show and they mentioned this this date. It is exactly today. <laughs> so there's yep. I don't know. It's, sometimes it, it weirds me out, <laughs> especially for example, Ghost in the Shell. Is, <laughs> it, it, it is kind of the coincidence, but it, it happens more often than I wish it would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and with all the events in the show of people's getting their, their brains hacked uh, to do things against their will, we're like, hold on. <laughs> Makes you question things. So yeah, really cool. I love the coincidence of events. Uh, that happened with <laughs> even with us and the anniversary of the show. Um, what do you say we get into it? All right. Okay. I will play the drop. Play a drop. I don't care how long that Bacchano jazz music goes. I love that thing. So glad you guys can hear that. <laughs> yep. So definitely. Fun. Although, to be fair, you can certainly hear the music yourself as soon as I say that. <laughs> it's very good. Very good music. Okay. So Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex Season 1, 26 episodes came out in the fall of 2002. Uh, ran a full year, essentially, uh, by production IG, uh, with our uh, favorite uh, creator, Tori. Who might that guy be? Uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I've never heard. We've never heard of him. Ghost We've never Michelle, covered never any anything that he's ever done. No. Nope. Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. Never heard of. Well, all right, we're gonna leave. We're gonna leave that there then uh, for fun. <laughs> 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 directed by Kazuo Wakabayashi. No, he was the sound director. No, it's directed by Kenji Kamiyama. <laughs> My God, I'm reading. Kenji I'm reading Kamiyama. Terribly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> directed by the sound director. Directed Damn. by the sound director. That's Shit. so. That's super weird. <laughs> <laughs> but we've certainly done uh, uh, quite a few shows by uh, Kamiyama between um, Jinro comes to mind. Uh, now I'm trying to remember what other. Mm -hmm. We did. Yeah, we did Rujin Z. <laughs> we did that. <laughs> we did indeed do Rujin Z, yes. Which he was an art director for. Anything else in particular? Can we ever cover memories? I don't think um, so. I, no, I think we did. I'm pretty sure we did. Have we done Akira? Yes. We, yeah, yes, we, we have. Did, right? It's wild. Yes. We're uh, we're over 160 100%. episodes of Listen. this, and we have to like, okay, what have we covered? <laughs> <laughs> what have we covered? Uh, the, the funny thing is, there's a lot of things we think we've covered that we actually haven't covered, and then there's a lot of things we're like, I don't remember covering that. It's like, wait a minute, yes, we did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we covered Akira in 2019, so forgive us for the forgetfulness uh, back in episode 48. <laughs> Whoa. I know this is. I remember us covering Jinro, but not Akira. Something's wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I know this is going to be surprising to everybody that listens to this, but like before we start recording, we don't always check the episode list to see what we've talked about already. I know, I know, crazy. Yeah, <laughs> we've been doing this podcast since the since the summer of 2017. <laughs> Holy shit. Although, although, to be fair with how we, we how we keep forgetting this shit, we, maybe we should start doing that, actually. Yeah, or, or, or redoing shows. Uh, if, we, uh, if we hit, like, 200, I bite. <laughs> you'll you'll bite at 200. Yeah. All right. You heard it here. Episode 199 will be the last episode no. of the Red Leaf Retro No, Hickey said he'll bite make, at redoing shows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, doing shows. We can go through the list. Episode two hundred. We go through the list from episode one to episode 
on 12 hours. I don't want to re-listen yeah, to that. Yeah, but that's going to require some actual editing. <laughs> I don't want to edit. I, you, I, it was bad <laughs> enough I had the to like... from all the episodes and splice them together. <laughs> okay. It's bad enough to, to get, so edit and... The, the, and recap yeah, episode, the recap episode is canceled. I'm going to go to a beach episode. Yeah. Then. I would love a beach okay. episode. Remember to bring your swimsuits. <laughs> yeah. we, need, we need to sell this. We need some fan service. A beach or a spa episode. Mm. Beach. Ooh. Yeah, be, uh, hmm. eh. uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure, maybe. Why not? Okay. I don't think it's going to sell that much, but you know what? Sure, let's do it. Because we make because so much money make... on this? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we can We can still put a Olsen scene in the in the beach episode. Every show does. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, the infamous Onsen on the beach. <laughs> yeah, it happens all the time. <laughs> it's like, I know. Man, Japan has some crazy resorts, dude. Holy sh! By the beach, there's an Onsen probably there is. <laughs> Honestly, it makes sense. I mean, yes, there one hundred percent is. Uh, an onset on the beach, and then when we're done there, we go directly to the spa. All right, got it. Yeah. Then we <laughs> we throw some fireworks. Sure. <laughs> watermelon full pitch episode okay mm. ghost in the shell stand alone complex in the not so distant future mankind has advanced to a state where complete body transplants from flesh to machine is possible this allows for great increases in both physical and cybernetic prowess and blurring the lines between the two worlds however criminals can also make use of such technology leading to new and sometimes very dangerous crimes in response to such innovative new methods, the Japanese government has established Section 9, an independently operating police unit, which deals with such highly sensitive crimes, led by Daisuke Aramaki and Makoto Kusanagi. Section 9 deals with such crimes over an entire social spectrum, usually with success. Ooh. However, when faced with Ooh. a new level hacker, or new A-level hacker, Nicknamed the Laughing Man, a very famous symbol. The team is thrown into a dangerous cat and mouse game following the hacker's trail as it leaves its mark on Japan. So the format of the show is more episodic than not. Uh, you follow various crimes. It's kind of like a detective show with a lot of cybernetic uh, disposition to expand the universe and world and what things are happening in the far off year of... What is it, 2036 this takes place? 2030? Around that time. Around that time. So mm -hmm. in our not-too-distant future. <laughs> yeah, and, 2030. Yeah, twenty. it had to be 2030 because they referenced the Laughing Man's cases six years ago, and that would be 2024. So it makes sense. Mm. And every once in a while, uh, throughout the first, I would say... 19 episodes you get a few episodes dedicated to the laughing man and then the final four or five episodes is dedicated to only the laughing man and the laughing man case and figuring it out which is my opinion the most exciting episodes of the show and the episodic nature helps fill in a lot of the information of the universe and why things work the way they are um very different from the movie that we that we covered where it's this just cybernetic um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, cyberpunk world uh, that we're used to from the movie. This really takes a departure and becomes that detective show. Uh, overall thoughts on one of yeah. my favorite shows. <laughs> yeah, it's better than the manga. <laughs> oh well, certainly sure. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had like no weird what? comedy. I, I brought up I brought up the discussion. Uh, uh, you know the the live action adaptation that was kind of disrespectful for not, but every single piece of well the the old 
media for Ghost in the Shell. They are adaptations of a manga and they are better than the manga. The manga is very comical. It's from the 80s, ni early 90s. So it's super comical. And in standalone complex, they are closer to the vibes of the manga. You have like a weird comedic tension through all the shows. Uh, so it, you, you can feel that it, it's kind of close. Some, some of the, the cases are from the manga as well. Uh, something that doesn't happen in the movies, uh, movie. The movie just gets the ending of the manga, if I believe. And the rest is kind mm. of like fabricated to, to fit the, the, the vibe that, that grim vibe I show. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely better than the manga. Although the, the comedic tension kind of sips in slowly. Uh, until like shit hits the fan and then Bato goes insane because he's he fought in a war and this was some shit. The twenty twenty I believe it's also twenty twenty four, right? Or like some World War Three starts. Something like that. Uh, yeah, something I don't know. Brothers Bart's God. That shit was fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, about that the entire part. Yeah. That part, and you also need to prepare for that because some episodes are have a have a complete different tone than, mm -hmm. especially if if it if it's with Bottle. Bottle has some really heavy hitting episodes <laughs> that completely dissonates from the rest of the show. That is like this comedic tension. That they drop the comedic tension, they go full on heavy shit. Then go back to comedic tension. <laughs> yeah, everything. So, it, it, yeah, all those yeah, episodes with Bato like, uh, really concentrate on his war, warring past. Uh, whether it's people that he used to know and go to war with, and they've fallen from grace, whether it's mentally or they've taken to a life of crime because for a variety of reasons. Hell, there's even an episode where he meets a martial arts expert. Uh, because he's siphoning off information from military ba bases. And he's like, man, I used mm. to idolize this guy. And each and every time, he's disappointed in one of his past friends or heroes. And it's it's inevitably always frustrating and sad for the man. Mm. Okay. But the, the Touch I mean, Coma to be fair, as well. The Touch Coma episode, yeah. I was going to say, that's kind <laughs> of the thing, though. Because Bato, the thing that kind of allows Bato to be the sort of Debbie Downer for me is just the fact that he is basically entirely for like a lot of those episodes offset by Touch Coma because you know they like him a lot. <laughs> and Touch Coma is the exact opposite. Touch Coma is just fucking hilarious to to a certain extent. Like they are yeah, a little a spider annoying, robot with a child personality. I, I like their <laughs> yeah. I I like their I like their innocence. It's just like man, the way they just completely go with the grips. It's like, aren't you afraid of that? Nah, I'll never die. Even if I am destroyed, they'll send, they'll simply take take the data that I've stored and plug it into a different one, and I'll keep on living. Doesn't matter. It's like, damn, <laughs> that's kind of fucked up. Okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, nah, it's uh, he, yeah, about those definitely a lot of the more serious stuff. It's, I feel like sometimes it can get a little a little annoying because like yes I the the military background but he's not the only one with military background I'm pretty sure the entirety of Section Nine has military background. Um, yeah, but he's the so he's the only well him and Aramaki they have they are uh, veterans and Mo Motoko also has a uh, Motoko, Motoko yeah, as well. I'm pretty sure she's Saito as well. I'm pr I'm pretty sure Saito has a uh, military background. I'm not sure about Ishikawa. But Saito definitely has a uh, Togo that does not. Togo's a police officer. Just, <laughs> just your straight man from the police academy. Yeah, he's he's, he's, he's a nineteen eighties police detective the... Togusa. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. he's like completely off the his elevator. Trench coat, <laughs> revolver, <laughs> a mullet. <laughs> yep. Uh, he came rich just like, because Listen. A, a, an AI from a rich guy that died was like, yo, you, you gave the dude a coin, so I'm going to make you rich. That actually happened. Yeah. It's Ken. <laughs> yep. 
No, I mean, like, yeah, that is as well. Just like in general, like that fucking episode where it's like, ah, oh, you might have to get, a, we might have to get away with a little bit of like fucking uh, replacing some body parts with machine parts <laughs> or robot parts. It's like, oh my god. It's like, yeah, that guy, that guy is just, that guy is just a dude. That guy is just a dude, and he's just there. It's like, why, why am I here? I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying so hard, but I can't. I can't do the things that Bato can. I can't do the things that Motoko can. Not a sniper like Saito. Not a hacker like Ishikawa. Not fun like Tachikoma. Not the man like Aramaki. But, but man, I can investigate. <laughs> he got a he got a cute side child. That's what matters. He's doing for the family. He's the True. family guy. God, family guy. <laughs> family man yeah, uh, yeah. Mm. also like in this one I like a lot of like the focus on like because there's a lot of focus on like the cybernization and whatnot you know obviously ghost in the shell uh, being full machine real personality what makes you human all of that stuff but mm -hmm. I like that there's a lot of focus in this one on the sort of idea of like what like sort of the things we cling on to as humans or especially like when you've gone all the way the things that uh, the characters cling on to like motoko and her watch and whatnot like these bato and his <laughs> his old cars like it's kind of like <laughs> those those weird like sentimental things that like you you sit there and be like man these really don't matter at all but like for some reason they matter a lot like they, they really oh. like trying to hammer that point home. It's just like, yeah, so we all got the those AI, things. <laughs> the correct yeah. AI for this sniper rifle. Yeah, because he's used to correcting for his own mistakes, and now that the AI is doing it, it, it fucks with him. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Well, what's interesting Pretty to me good. is the constant building of the universe uh, throughout the show, whether that's explaining to us um, various diseases because of cybernetics. Um, mostly related to the brain because mm. of cyber brain technology. Uh, I mean, hell, the whole cyber purpose of the laughing... Sclerosis. Yeah, the whole purpose of the laughing man case, as we learn near the end of the show, is based on this uh, cyber brain deterioration that they claim is sclerosis and the hiding of an immunity through out of it or a cure. Uh, and to me, what's also interesting is the development of all of these different body parts and Makoto Kusanagi, our main character, Miss Violet, violent, violet-haired woman herself, uh, very famous uh, character design and personality is, we get an episode where we know she's been, she has this cybernetic body essentially her whole life because of a degenerative disease that she had, and her actual age is more or less unknown, uh, and you can only determine various things based on her mysterious abilities. It's like, why is she so good at every sort of martial arts known to man? Why is she so good at hacking? Uh, <laughs> to even be to the point on <laughs> the level... Or as Bato of... said... <laughs> What's up? Or as Bato would put it, <laughs> why, do you, why do you insist on having a female model? <laughs> right, and it's like a 20-something-year-old model. Yeah, just become a man, If and she, <laughs> she whoops his ass and goes, you know what, this is doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad they didn't call her for, a, for by her mm. her hacking status because all oh, oh, these people are a <laughs> a rank uh, hackers and then you have Motoko that she's a wizard level. <laughs> <laughs> <Hacker>. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this, this this will never not be funny. Mm. So, yeah, she's she's not she's a wizard level. It's like holy fuck, what? <laughs> what what does a wizard level mean? <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, but I'm I'm more I'm more of the mind that Makoto's like actually in her like late twenties. That's what I've always led to, led to believe because of the invention of the cybernetics and how it developed as she was. Because I've read some things like she she's actually in her her fifties and sixties and she just prefers that. But I don't know it. Every sign to me points that her head and face are the only thing that, like, ages. Or am I wrong in mis misremembering things? Well, her face is... Her face cannot age. Yeah, she's just, you know, she changes her uh, her model. 
I thought. Uh, I thought. No, I thought it was established. She's a, ghost. she's a literal ghost. Yeah, but she still has she an original real like body. cyborg body, right? Yes. Yeah. But she can. She can hawk bodies. Well, we know that at the near the end of the episodes. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't have any flesh. She's just a ghost. I think it's better right. explained in right. the movie, like the first movie, because you have the the AI. That is, yeah. So, like, they explain, cool. like, are you sure you you're human in like not an AI? Because right. you okay. have a, you, you don't yeah, have yeah. any piece of flesh. It's like you are a robot. So like what is this thing that you call a ghost? You know, yeah. can you be sure you're not like Bato that fucking got his <laughs> half of his body exploded in war and that's why he <laughs> he got the fucking cybernetic body. Like you were a child when when that happened. Can you be sure that the memories of you being a, sh- a child and having flesh are not AI implemented into you? So you're an AI thinking you have you're you have a ghost? Yeah. You know, those kind of things. But, I, it's better explained in the movie, but the movie canon thing, it's kind of shaky because the movie is way too extravagant to, to go with the shell for all. Uh, but those things are thing better sort of, explored in, in a sense as well, the second, the second movie. Yeah, but the thing that sort of gets to me, because there is a certain point where they talk about Motoko, which was why she changed her body to the one that she uses, you know, before she changes it again, uh, which was because the old one stopped fitting. So at that point, it's like, was there a certain point where she, like, I assume that has to then be before she became complete ghost, but I'm not entirely sure. Like, it, if she's just ghost, it doesn't make any sense for her body not to fit her, unless it's just her personality outgrew her fucking... Or the, or her brain was developing and needed to attribute to something else growing, which would have been her Could various be. bodies. That's why. Could be. But I don't really. Maybe that's why I was thinking. Maybe that's why that I was thinking for anymore. the longest time that the only thing that would age would be her like head because of that original image of her going through those changes, and then, uh, like Hickey said, at, at one point, yes, she does become full cybernetic. But what what exactly is that? When exactly was that point is not exactly clear. Mm. But you said, Tori, that there's always some the sort of connection that you got to make. And with her, in her case, it's the watch. That's her connection to mm. reality. Yep. Very cool universe. That old watch. Uh, obviously, would you put your brain in a robot body? Uh, I mean, the, th- the thing... What was the that one horror game? You know, uh, the guy wakes up in a in a facility and he's a he's a robot. <laughs> uh, because because here, like the problem is, it's not that the you put in your brain into a robot is your brain is a machine. In this so universe, like, yeah, it's it's everything's become this like AI level brain. Yeah, so you don't you don't have a physical brain. You have a machine inside of your head. Yeah. Is that you? If you if you get well, your that's soul, the question, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and then <and> transfer. <laughs> so like so if you're thinking about that, would wouldn't you just go full serial experiments lane and just plug yourself into the internet? Well, ma- the major kind of does that the whole like throughout the show. She just randomly dives into the internet and like she's driving, <laughs> much like we, much like Were people you diving this entire time. Yeah, <laughs> like become, someone on their cell become, phone uh, while driving. <laughs> Very apt. Would you become the little box <laughs> from the the CEO? The no, CEO little... hell no, hell no, absolutely. No. Yeah, no, I mean it depends. Like, see, the thing is because you know obviously we all know that uh, Ghost in the Shell obviously stole its concept from Galaxy uh, Galaxy Express thirty nine uh, because you know that's of kind course. of that's kind of the same point, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, go, like to, that, the, go to the go to the robot world world world. To, where you can live forever. Yeah, and, that's that's yeah. the thing that always comes to me, and it's just like, man, that just seems so fucking sad. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like either you try to cling on to life by just becoming a fucking the homicidal maniac that just wants to kill everything just to feel something, or you live <laughs> out the rest of your life doing fuck all because you don't need anything anymore. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> yay. Very exciting, right? Well, Makoto uh, Kusanagi here, the major, um, one of her things that she does randomly throughout the show is have sex with whomever. <laughs> yeah. Just male, female, robot, doesn't totally. matter. She's just like, okay, let's do this. And then she's like, kicks him out, like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I get the job done. <laughs> Wonder how you would mimic you those sensations, <laughs> right? Do you just plug yourself into the other person? Is that how that works? Uh, I mean, but then you, uh, you mess, fair, that's, mixing that's more, with ghosts. Uh, that's more. That's more the second season, which has a, a moment of that. What? Well, not a moment of that. Uh, more of a joke about that, if I remember correctly. The uh, the incident with the. Uh, with a kid who got curious about about if she felt any sort of pleasure, and she just goes, "Want to find out?" Yeah, right. <laughs> <He's> like, no. <laughs> you want to see how this works, baby? <laughs> <laughs> she goes, "Hell no, hell no, you're old." <laughs> yeah, there were also hints that she's actually older than what she was, but that was more speculation from the rest of the group when they have like random conversations and then. The major comes in. Yeah, and because she's I mean, like, again, what's that, going on, boys? That is the thing with Motoko. Yeah. That is the thing with Motoko. Like, she is just a giant ass mystery. Like, who is she? Like, actually, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because everyone has this like clear really past. Is, but... You know, Togusa hmm. with the with the police force, and he's got a wife. Bato's got the military background. Uh, you have um, Aramaki with his just wild connections and clear political. Uh, things he's constantly got to work out through the show. Ishikawa is just this like hangout hacker that kind of knows everybody through various uh, past degrees. You got um, who's the sniper guy? What's his name? Saito. 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 Yeah, yeah. So everyone kind of has their past. Then it's just uh, there's Makoto. It's like uh, so. What's your deal? Ah, you know, I grew up in a hospital with robot parts. Well. Girl, you you're so much better than that. Like, how <laughs> could you explain? Nah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? I grew up in a hospital. Okay, I'm uh, fully cybernetic. Fully cybernetic. Uh huh. I used to. Uh, I used to control. I was in the military. I was the leader of an entire platoon. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Sure. I'm a wizard level hacker now. It's like ah. Uh, hmm. I work for How? Section 9. All right. Interesting. How did you get into contact with Aramaki? Don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about anything. <laughs> nah, you don't get in contact with Aramaki. Aramaki just gets, Aramaki gets in contact with you. He just shows up one day and he's like, yeah, so yeah, anyway, want to work for me? Fucking <laughs> shows up. Literally the Togu's a backstory. Aramaki just shows up one day. <laughs> yeah. There's also the sense with um, Makoto about her what's the word her comfortability with the quote unquote showing skin aspect right where mm -hmm. usually people are kind of more on the shy side and when it comes to her just kind of i don't want to sound crude but it's like her stripping it's it's not ne it's never uh, the sense of shyness and covering it up she just kind of it's like yep it's a robot body it's not real it's not real quote unquote so it's it's always kind of second nature to her. It's never a concern. I, know. Mm. I mean, you know, especially in the standalone complex where she has to wear some uh, rather interesting outfits. But yeah, no, it's uh, that is just kind of kind of her. I mean, I don't know. It's never really explicitly stated anywhere, but I feel like it always just has to do with kind of her personality, like her her teasing way ways, just the way she kind of like she does that with a lot of characters, whether it's those those girls that she goes to sometimes, or, or even pretty much anyone else. Like she has no problem basically, basically just being like flirtatious or being stuff so like that, or just and half the time she doesn't even consider it, like showing up full and it literally just her underwear, or basically naked, it's like. So what? Like, yeah. And she doesn't say anything. Really, she doesn't even acknowledge it. <laughs> she's the only female character using those kind of clothes as well throughout mm -hmm. the show. So I Which, think it's uh, more of a more of a personality <laughs> thing. Yep. 
Well, at least in this. The, uh, the other movie one. as well. Arise. Yeah, but it, like in Arise, there's some there's some other characters that wear some uh, interesting outfits. Yeah, but it's Arise. <laughs> <laughs> it is Arise. <laughs> Arise, uh, Arise doesn't count. <laughs> we stop at the second season of Standalone Complex. Nah, we should definitely watch Arise at some point too. Uh, sure. Not that bad. <laughs> okay, so with the Laughing Man case, because what ended up happening since we're a week late here is I watched the whole show and then I watched the seven core episodes involving the laughing man himself. Uh, so I kind of rewatched just under a third of the series over again, uh, just for fun. And the episode that really always sticks with me is the one where it's a group of people that have dove into this essential chat room and Kusanagi goes mm -hmm. in there and, cosplays as some other person and just li essentially listening and chiming in every once in a while with a question over people trying to break down the laughing man because they're all sort of fans of his and his level of hacking and what he stands for and how he's able to hack into other people's brains and kind of alter them uh, to the point where we get one episode where Togusa goes into um, undercover at a uh, brain degenerative facility with kids or well no it's um what do they uh, call that? that that's one of the best episodes yeah that's one uh, of the best uh, ones re, and re, the rehab, laughing man himself center yeah the rehab center for kids that just um well it's essentially an allegory of kids can't put their phones down so they're constantly linked up to the internet <laughs> it's my turn today <laughs> it's my turn today yeah uh so yeah, we get we get mm -hmm. Kusanagi and all these people just breaking down the societal norms and what are the motivations behind the Laughing Man, and uh, that that episode's among my favorites and most interesting because nothing really happens. It's just a bunch of people talking and spewing dialogue, but it's what the dialogue is entailing that's always very engaging to me. Mm. They also bring up a lot of the points that gets revealed later on. Yeah, you don't that notice nothing it. but speculations. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's just theories. That's and it, it makes sense, right? Because the thing is, obviously, they have to address like the the lack of motive of the laughing man, and then the weird shift in how everything goes. Now, you obviously eventually you do learn why that is, right? And that sort of comes back into the actual finale finale of the show. But it is definitely interesting and uh, a very interesting for a piece of sort of. Uh, I guess you could call it future detective work as well, but just in general as well, where it's like Section 9 is essentially like, you know, they're looking into this this a little bit at this point, and it's like no one really knows. Nobody really has anything to work on. So it's like, all right, what do we do? Well, fuck it. Let's, let's fucking look out, uh, check out some people that have, that have interest in this and have like better interest in this and whatnot and just see what they come up with. What do they think? And just essentially participating in a brainstorming session for just maybe something shows up, maybe some clues. And, you know, they do discover some things like, you know, the weird interference when they were protecting the, um, uh, protecting the police chief guy, uh, from the, uh, from an incident, right. Figuring out like Motoko obviously realized that somebody was looking at something in there, but she didn't know who it was in this brainstorming session. She did find who it was and sort of whatnot. So realized where they, she could get more information and whatnot. This just, it's a very interesting, interesting episode in that sense, even though it is, you know, basically an entire episode dedicated to a bunch of people sitting around the table talking <laughs> until eventually the, the fucking mm -hmm. the chat room leader's mom comes in and goes like, get off the Internet. He's like, oh, <laughs> oh, mom. <But> mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very it's very relatable mm. to especially even our modern era <laughs> where look at us. We're we're in a fucking virtual chat room here just talking about these people brainstorming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is it so different? <laughs> uh, I mean, we're I not mean, we're not full diving, so yeah, it's very different. <laughs> if we were using VR chat, at least we could. That's you know what? That's a great plan. Next next podcast episode, we're in VR chat. <laughs> okay, who has VR, who has yeah. PS4 or fives with the with the VR <laughs> set? Because we could do that. 
I live in uh, Brazil. No, me. I have a PC, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so none of us have the same technology to VR dive. Gotcha. <laughs> one day. One day. Fuck. One day we can wait, VR wait, one Six day. years. Six years in a world war. Together. <laughs> Hell yeah. I, that could happen. Could happen. <laughs> it, yeah. It very much could happen. Oh, boy. Right, the Laughing Man is a really good story. Uh, like an anime in, in general, being shoehorned into the the original story, it ends with the with the movie. But I think it's a it's a nice one. Like how the the level of com- conspiracy is not too complicated to follow. Uh, uh, yeah, it's really not, and that's that's what makes it more enjoyable. At the same point. You can follow along with each thread that gets uh, that gets pulled. Be and a political conspiracy is very easy to comprehend, right? And yeah. there's the ledger episode with Togusa goes to what was it the Sunshine Society uh, that's against the uh, cyberbrain sclerosis, uh, not scandal, but um, hidden reasons on why vaccine. this vac- yeah this vaccine was yeah not man. approved. They're going out against the nanomachine uh, treatment that was approved instead. Yeah, they go against fucking special. It becomes special forces against special forces, which is also very interesting. Mm. The power struggles because it's the like anti-drug, anti-drug special force. The policemen, <laughs> very, uh, ir- and very and ironic, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's like who who are these people? It's like oh, they're basically sleeping agents. Like you don't know they're police officers because they just work normally in society, but when like when duty calls, they they just appear. That's why, it, you know, it starts the everything in that episode with the sunshine. I thought the first time I watched, I thought it was a a terrorist attack, right? Because everyone is in civilian mm-hmm. clothes, right? But then it, it it is it is explained that no the. The anti-drug police officers, they just, they are just members of society. They just don't appear with uniforms and why not? Suddenly, a bunch of civilians with guns appears and apprehend people. I was like, oh, that's clever. <laughs> that's and of thing. course, because they, because that's always how it has to be with the fucking anti-drug unit, the fucking leader of the platoon is obviously a fucking psycho. Yeah. <laughs> A psycho and a cyborg on every top of time. It. <laughs> yep, <laughs> and a pussy. <laughs> well, <laughs> didn't like it when you were put in that position, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the show does a good it. job of expressing the difference between uh, permanent de- perma death, essentially, and temporary. We'll call it death. Where there's something simple mm. as Togusa being shot, and because he's not, he's the least cybernetic of like anyone in the show. Uh, to the point of when someone is so confident in their ghost being transferred, when you're es- explicitly told, "Oh no, we've kept you from transfer," you like you will be deleted essentially. Then there's the sense of fear that comes back of death. Really like that in the show. Mm. Yeah, because you know. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> for for you and me, getting shot is kind of a big deal. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it certainly would feel uncomfortable. <laughs> I understood that one. <laughs> I understood the whole getting shot part. <laughs> uh, uh, no, yeah, you know, it, oh. There's even like political intrigue with the section nine being disbanded, and like, oh, it's mm-hmm. because you know, you guys are wrecking too much havoc and. The elections are coming. Yeah, I need to pass the bill. So, so you get a little bit of more the the green things. Like it, it, it's a it's a very very good show. Pretty much enjoyed it. The first season, second season is the second season. Second season's a little less uh, intriguing as this one, and the Laughing Man case is so good and well thought out that anything less is amplified i felt yeah it's a it's a good detective story even like getting so close to the to actually catching the laughing man because he was in the rehab facility you know Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and you kind of like immediately know it's that like, that kid is. It's uh, it's very much like the reveal in Saw, the first movie, where you're like, okay, this uh, this body on the ground was the actual mastermind, while that episode is following around kid in the wheelchair, and he's the actual like mastermind of the whole facility, and he's the laughing man. He can reprogram Togus's brain to only uh recount the laughing man symbol which i think is one of the cooler uh twists and turns throughout the whole like journey <laughs> and it's like okay yeah, yeah. oh relatable episode is the one where uh one of the uh one of the like daughters is kidnapped by um it's like pirates or something and when they finally like get to rescue them it's actually this old woman who's been under the stress of being this kidnap victim uh, rapidly ages while there's this other little girl there. And they're like, oh, OK, <laughs> what happened to you? <laughs> so why is the laughing man this uh, seemingly 14 year old child? Right. Mm. It's very, very. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when you when you think back onto that facility with all of the kids that are uh, hyper adaptive and obsessed with diving on the internet, essentially, you're like, oh, so he's like borderline autistic to this situation in this world. All he wants to do is read books, guys. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. All physical media. <laughs> Preserve the physical media. <laughs> Just let him be in the library. He won't hack you. He swears. <laughs> <laughs> he won't hack you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and if he did, you wouldn't even know. <laughs> True. Yeah. Um, Makoto Kusanagi is one of my favorite characters in all of anime, like, ever. I, I love her. I love the character. I love the mystery behind her. Uh, good action scenes always mm -hmm. follow with her and her supporting cast, whether it's the snipers, Bato just kicking ass uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I always feel Motoko is one of those weird characters because, like, technically, a lot of a lot of the things with Motoko is the fact that, like, or it, it's kind of things that we would normally associate with like badly written characters. Because, like, realistically speaking, you are you are still lacking a lot of like not development, but you are lacking a lot of history with her but it's kind of it's kind of how they you you get enough out of her you get enough sort of context around her in general that it doesn't matter even though at the end of the day you will always come back thinking to yourself like man <laughs> i don't technically know much about this person no one does <laughs> but the mystery is what we keep going back to that mystery aspect of her and that's what makes it so intriguing she'll always be a mystery I know, that's, that's my point yeah that's my point but it's like it's really difficult to write these sorts of characters because usually People will just come come out from it thinking, man, this character sucks ass. There's like no <laughs> depth to them whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, I think it helps that she's she has the the stalking, <laughs> all of those stalking sequences. So she's always in the always in the episode, even when she's yeah. not a prominent character, either with the kid body or the or herself. She'll just be around. So there's also a lot of like stuff she just shows you. And there's also a lot of stuff she just shows you, like without really like talking about it very much. So you always get those like weird like context stuff around her. It's nice. It's nice. Definitely a definitely a good character. Definitely an interesting character to come back to in basically any media. Yeah, yeah. Boy, is there a lot of or the, media. My favorite robot in anime. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know about that, but they are, they're up there. <laughs> yeah, I like a lot of them. Just super the, the military grade itself. spiders. Like, good God. <laughs> yeah. It's the uh, silliness. The, the silly, reason. yeah. When they, <laughs> when start, they start debating. developing personalities or they fucking, when they even start getting lazy, when they're like not paying attention, they're, they're assigned to literally be like body shields, like throw themselves in front of da danger so that the people from section nine won't, won't get in danger <laughs> or won't risk being destroyed or, or die. And they're like too busy with other stuff, not paying attention. <laughs> uh, 
Right. They are developing individuality, <laughs> like speaking right. double, yeah. like a double speak because there's a touchy comma, <laughs> invisible touchy comma just <laughs> watching us like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's okay. Oh, We're not man. going to get destroyed, people. And like the, the political the political speech <laughs> of who is who is who is battles uh touch coma as well mm-hmm. great. or that fucking that that fucking nerd touch coma that was <laughs> that had so much to say about like the fucking about like death and shit like that who eventually <laughs> eventually got to live out his full dream of having his fucking cyber brain picked apart and experienced true death <laughs> <laughs> it's so random but I love it. Uh, I think we all wish to go out that way. I want to experience true death. I can't have wait. Have my brain picked apart? Yeah. <laughs> Your brain yeah, picked sure, apart. Dude. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can't wait for that. <laughs> Man. But cyber brain first, obviously. Nah, we gotta do it with a real brain. See how that works. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, yes, the good old lobotomy. I think they did a lot of this. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think we need to go back to that one. <laughs> you sure? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> All right, fine, fine. I guess we'll do it with a cyber brain. Then. All right. All right. Then. Hickey doesn't want. Hickey brain. doesn't want a lobotomy. He's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly not. <laughs> I, I like. I like to control my you know my body functions <laughs> no but you'll uh, be experiencing true death so what's a what's a little picking apart at, uh, beforehand that's a good question yeah i think because the true death won't come well true death in the sense that i won't be me and i'll not realize i'm alive anymore it's kind of a true death but well, you're presuming true, an awful lot <laughs> man what is what is this conversation they can make a show out of this they could <laughs> I think they did. It's called Chaos Child. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. God, Chaos Child. Man. All right, I'm ready to score this. Uh, same. Okay. Uh, when I first watched this a number of years ago, I guess it's more than 10 years at this point, uh, I went 9 out of 10. It was so fascinating and upper level for me at the time. I have no reason to really drop the score, considering that upon rewatching uh, multiple times in this iteration, because the dialogue is so deep and the universe is so interesting and every character has their own unique and mystery and background to them, along with political intrigue, I see nothing, no reason for me to drop the score. It's still this, it's still that enjoyable. The animation's good. The music is very cyber. (laughs) <laughs> very it fits everything in the show cyber the the ed the ending um like little rap deal is very uh early 2000s <laughs> it matches the you know. opening is great yes yeah except oh, the cgi the opening. but yeah, well yeah the, the visuals of the opening is not the greatest but that's kind of that welcome to fucking welcome to Sandman complex yeah <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, nah, that the actual song by Ori guys just God. Oh, that that I I never skipped that opening. Yeah, <laughs> it did. It did surprise me upon my rewatch how less of the Laughing Man I I remember there being. So, mm. I think that's what's keeping me from like a perfect score kind of deal in my fandom. So I'm still I'm still sitting at a nine out of ten. Very much enjoy the show. It's one of my favorites of all time. Would, if I was to make a top one hundred anime I've ever watched, this would uh, be clear in that list. No 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 issue. Which would be a fun task to do. <laughs> Almost like I did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, not nah. um, kind of same for me. So when my experience with Ghost in the Shell, like way back when, when I watched it the first time. I originally enjoyed uh, Standalone Complex a uh, hell of a lot more than I did the movie upon first watch. Uh, I've since rewatched the movie, and uh, I do like the movie a lot more now than I did back then. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, this is my first time rewatching Standalone Complex. So I was curious to see how that would affect my opinion on this show, and sort of to my surprise, 
I come back to the show basically feeling the exact same as I did the first time. I It's definitely not as clear of the movie this time around as it was when I watched the movie the first time, but I do still think I kind of hold a little bit of a hand over standalone complex to than the, uh, the Mamoru Roshi movie, but it's only slightly. But I do still really enjoy it. Uh, some things here and there's some episodes kind of I don't don't care for that much. Like Hickey said, some of the humor at times feels a little like, kind of like you know, including those bad parts of the manga a little bit and doesn't quite add up. But it, it's never enough to ruin the experience for me. Like, it's still still very good. But I, I come out to like an eight, I think, which is the same score as I gave the uh, the movie as well upon rewatch. So, you know. It's a very good score. It, yeah. <laughs> so I read that eight. Yeah. Eight is a good score. Maybe you could argue a nine, but I, no, I, I'm comfortable with an eight, which is the same score as I had the first time around. Eight. But nothing changed. <laughs> yeah, my score, I will, I will also not change. It will keep an eight. Standalone complex and like any piece of media for Ghost in the Shell, it, it, it lends itself in a... <laughs> in a really hard place to be because JD and I read the, the manga and oh. we know how the, <laughs> how the manga goes. It's weird, right? wacky. <laughs> it's super wacky. It's basically a comedy. So you get to the adaptation with the movie and you have <laughs> probably, I don't know if it's a mistake or if it's a miracle, but you get Mamoru Oshii to direct Ghost in the Shell. And Mamoru Oshii looks at the, the manga and goes, man, this is a cool universe. This is a cool ending for the manga. Then he torches it. He doesn't throw away. He just burns it and makes his own thing. So you have two pieces of media, which are both important. You have the original manga which is very comical and kind of wacky and you have ghost in the shell the movie by mamoru Oshii, which is super serious super philosophical and super hard to watch you need to get to a point where you're respecting the manga but you're also respecting the movie but you cannot use the ending of the manga because it was used at the ending of the movie and you don't want to tv adapt the movie, so you you need to come up with an original story on top of that to be the ending of Ghost in the Shell, modifying everything to be a Ghost in the Shell universe. So you get to like some things I was, I was talking about, where the tension of the show is all over the place because sometimes you're trying to copy the tension of the manga, sometimes you're trying to copy the tension of Mamoru Oshii. It gets kind of weird from time to time. The characters are kind of snappy in personality, especially Bato. Poor Bato, he just gets so, so much shit because his personality is being split so much between the movie and the manga, where he, his decisions are just super snappy. It feels like he has some some sort of uh, psychological disorder. <laughs> wow. Some bipolar disorder because Byman is just in the same episode changing so much. And it's not like... Oh no, he's more serious this time. Oh no, he's more playful this time. Though no, his personality changes 180 in, in a matter of seconds because of I guess it depends on on who is writing the episode as well and how he what the impression of the person is of a ghost in the show. But a lot of other things are very easy. You don't need to think too hard about the music of this series because you know it's the same director. Kazuhiro uh, Wakabayashi is the same sound director, so he just copied the things from the movie and adapted a little bit because of copyright and why not. So it's kind of the same music; it's already super good. Uh, you don't need you need to to match a little bit the the filmography and, and um, camera work of Mamoru Oshii, but more often than not, they did a a, a good. Um, a, a, a good job you need to feel the aesthetics so sometimes you have that uh flashy but 
this focal lens of the movie in the series, but it's not a hundred percent of the time. It's just from time to time, some close-ups. You have the the movie shots, which which is also kind of again in that place where I need to balance two very important things: the original manga and this super awesome movie that is a really good movie but it's not ghost in the shell <laughs> <laughs> and because of that it, it lands itself i think it, it landed perfectly it wasn't you know they didn't land face first but they they hurt their knee on the fall uh and i, I gave it an eight it, it's a good series i think it's as best as it can be of a manga adaptation because you cannot use the end of the manga. <laughs> the movie just blew it out of the park. And it, it needs to fill those gaps of the movie as well. So yeah, an eight is is a good is a good score for the show. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna turn around this episode and uh hopefully next week. Boy oh boy. Tori, what are you getting <laughs> us into to follow Ghost in the Shell? <laughs> And ergo proxy. I mean, <laughs> listen, there is only one way we can go with this, right? Like, the, I think you all see the path laid out in front of us. Like, there's only one show, realistically, that fits the bill to come after these two. And that is Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero. Oh, God. There's 27 episodes. All right. <laughs> Yu-Gi! <laughs> Yu-Gi! I mean, listen, it's, it fits somehow. <laughs> All right, everybody. That does it here. It does. Look forward to Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> See you next time. Peace! Goodbye.